Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in, Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you for those that continue to tune in uh, to the show. Most of you are probably aware of my now we do uh, usually about two shows a week if we can, sometimes less depending on what's going on. We no longer have that fun little uh, great studio we used to have where we'd have Jack and other guests in on a regular basis. That studio was kind of fun, but uh, we've been sequestered like everybody else now here. I am on my my desktop, but I guess we got Jack Russo in today. We're going to be talking about how the um, how real estate is going to be affected by the new election and the new administration. We'll talk a little bit about that. But, um, you know, I guess on one side, we should be grateful that we still have the ability to do this, right? You're in Florida. I'm in California. And we could still uh, have these podcasts and still communicate. I think Silicon Valley has adapted in the fastest way imaginable and Zoom and others, WebEx and a bunch of other suppliers of video services have just had a heyday. It's shocking that Apple hasn't really had FaceTime Good take point. off as yeah. you know, it's on every iPhone and you would think it would be part and parcel of business, but it's not. I think Zoom more or less owns the market. It's shocking to me that Apple hasn't tried to buy Zoom or even, you know, Microsoft is trying to use Teams with video to pursue Zoom, but Zoom pretty much has become the easy to use approach and it works even for podcasting and webcasting and the rest. And when yeah, you record, plus, uh, it gives you that value. What's the, you know, what's interesting, Jack, too, is, you know, some of it's by the design, some of it's by luck, as you know, you've been in business so long, but what's interesting to me now is Zoom is almost like what you, people used to refer to as, I'm going to go Xerox a copy. My point is, I don't care if you're using Teams or what, does it, don't you find that everybody says we had a Zoom meeting, whether it was Zoom or not? Right, whatever the carrier is, yeah. whatever the right. tool is, it's become Zoom like Xerox, yeah. make a Xerox copy. Right. And they have to worry that Zoom could become generic from a trademark point of view. Mm. which is which has got to be worrisome to them because they don't want that to happen their value is pretty much all the goodwill yeah but getting to the topic at hand i think that everyone has been imagining well maybe the best outcome for this election would have been a split outcome where essentially nothing can get done in washington (laughs) dc that was a lot of what happened during the obama administration where (laughs) Essentially, there was sort of a blocked situation in the Senate. But given really the fact that there's going to be a majority in both the House and the Senate as a result of these Georgia runoff elections, that's really the topic at hand, which is now there is the potential for a major liberal democratic agenda. And of course, there's a radical left that's out there too, as we know, that's been pushing the Bernie Sanders socialism, you know, extreme socialism. I mean, we already have a form of socialism in the United States, whether you call it Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare or a billion different federal programs that do absorb a lot of tax dollars. But I think the biggest thing to realize is if you are a small business person or an entrepreneur and you believe in capitalism and you believe in hard work, you're going to see a lot more programs that go in the other direction. And you're going to be feeling like I must be paying for this somehow because taxes have to go up to pay for these programs. There's no other way to balance other than the indirect way, which is print a lot of money and have a lot of inflation. So that bungalow. uh, There's a lot that's going to go into, we could kind of piece it apart or kind of unpack it here. And I, 
You're right. I think they're, we're going to see a lot of new changes because they have the majority and they're, they're going to make some adjustments. How it will reflect on real estate. I mean, as an industry, I know the National Association of Realtors is, is a really strong lobbying body. I didn't realize this until I you know, started some in-depth research several years ago, but the uh, National Association of Realtors spends more money than the pharmaceutical industry on lobbying, which was a surprise to me. But I guess that's kind of part of this conversation is regardless of the power, what do you think? I've certainly have my thoughts. What, where do you see some of the changes that may take place in, on the real estate landscape? I guess whether it be residential or commercial. Well, you got to look at it as both residential and commercial and then divided federal versus state and maybe mm -hmm. even state versus county or local. Mm -hmm. But let's just keep it simple two by two. Yeah. And you could take each of those cells and you could say, okay, start with the federal changes that affect uh, residential. Mm -hmm. So some examples that already are starting to play out, have been playing out for a while. You used to be able to deduct all of your interest payment. Even if you had like a $3 million mortgage on your house, you would get all those interest payments. They kept lowering those numbers. They kept lowering them. They were like, we're gonna look at what's a reasonably sized house. And I think at one point it was like, oh, the debt can be 1.5 million. Then that dropped to like 1.2. If I don't have the exact numbers. Uh, what dropped point, to 1.1, 1, 1. yep. Yeah, 1.1. 1. Yep. 1. And then I think it dropped further even still, or it will drop further. So now and it's part, at 750. Yeah, so part yeah. of it is tied to, hey, look, most of America can live in a house that doesn't cost seven figures. Most of America doesn't live in California. You can't find a house in California for a typical four person family, three person family, one child, two children, a couple of dogs. You can't find that house for less than a million dollars. I mean, I was gonna say Palo Alto, you know, <laughs> cottages for, you know, $3,000 a square foot, a thousand foot cottage on a little right. postage stamp lot. $3 million, but walking distance to downtown Palo Alto, uh, and there's not much going on in downtown Palo Alto. So as much as you want to talk about walking distance, everything's more or less closed. Yeah. Not everything, but a lot of things are. And I mentioned this in a, in, to a colleague recently that the, the, the Walgreens drugstore that's been in Palo Alto for 50, 60, 70 years closed. Wow. So shocking. Wow. Like, how does that happen? So then you could step into the next box, which is residential on the state side of things. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see some stuff like Proposition 19, which says that, hey, when you sell your house or you give your house to your kids, there's going to be a step up in basis unless right. you do some really smart things before February 15 or so. There's going to be prejudice to that very, very low assessed value, like my next door neighbor has. Mm -hmm. He has an assessed value in Portola Valley for the for my property in, in Portola Valley that's currently now rented because I'm here in Florida. But he bought his place 50 years ago. I think the value, the assessed value is under 200,000. The property is probably a $10 million property. So if, unless he takes steps <laughs> to put that property into either an LLC or into a trust, that's an irrevocable trust. So mm -hmm. title actually is transferred or the LLC is an irrevocable LLC. If it's just in a standard living will revocable trust, it doesn't do it. So yeah. he's got to take some steps or else his kids will be paying property taxes that are like 50 times higher. Yeah. I mean, literally 50 times higher. So wow. if his property taxes right now might be, you know, 500 bucks, his kids might pay property taxes of like $25,000. Think about that. That's over. Yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be an interesting move. You know, the other piece of the, the limitations they put on, as you know, you were talking about the mortgage uh, allowance for interest deductions. Now, seven maximum loan amount of 750000 
but they also capped out your property tax at 10,000. So along right. the same lines, as you know, if you had, you know, a $20,000 property tax a bill, you used to have the ability to write that 100% off, but now they max out at 10 grand. Right. So, so, so you've got a lot of things that are putting pressure on the true cost of home ownership. You could say there was a lot of incentives <laughs> to buy a home. It was like a savings bank. You were working hard. You were stretching. I know in the mortgage area, you like to say, well, you should have a third of your income available to cover that loan. And if it's more than a third, it's going to be difficult. But I don't know how you do the calculations today and with the kind of pricing that's out there. So you got this trend that's in the direction of house pricing is going up because money is cheap. You can get a loan for 3%. Some people say maybe you get a loan for even in the twos. You can, I don't know yeah. how you can get to that number, but there are people that are saying that. So it seems like the monthly cost is cheaper, but the housing prices have gone up. Right. And if those interest rates change, they're typically variable rates to start with. If they change, then people may find out, you know, the true cost when you're done paying the property taxes and the maintenance and the this and the that and the other thing, the insurance and so on. It's it's much bigger than a 30 year salary. And of course, if there's a layoff, which could be something to plan on, because there are definitely employers that don't like this work at home stuff and want to figure out outsourcing mechanisms that allow them to say, well, I don't even need to have uh, a workforce. Yeah. I think a lot of this, a lot of the new policies, my guess is, and uh, things that come into effect as it relates to housing, my guess is, I don't want to throw, put the blanket around the whole thing, but the Democrats, I think that one of the agendas will definitely be, and I think will always be, is we need to figure out a, how to keep taxing what they call the wealthy or the rich, right? So, which is not, which is not in, in California, you know, used to be if you were a millionaire, you were, right. you were rich, but if you're a millionaire, you're middle class in California. <laughs> That's right. I think I would even go so far as to say if you're a 10 millionaire, you're not exactly in upper class. I know that could be disputed, but I'm saying today, it's not like my dad's era when he said, right. if, I, if I only I were a millionaire, there used to be right. a TV program saying, you know, yep make me a millionaire, stuff right. like that. Like that was the great end all be all. I think half of Californians are millionaires and they kind of feel like they're stretched. Right. Yeah, because no, it's, I think it's so a much. good point. So, so I would think that they're going to continue making it more expensive for people who make more money. I think we could probably figure on that. How is that going to impact, impact the housing industry? I mean, real estate, maybe, some of these people, whether they're millionaires or multimillionaires or probably large property owners, maybe they start thinking or rethinking what they do with those properties. I don't know. I mean, I still think regardless, I'm a big fan of diversification. So real estate to me would always be a place that if you can, you want to have holdings in real estate your entire life and grow them if you can to a certain extent, because unless they come up with you know, unless Elon gets people moving to Mars anytime soon, we still need places to live. And, you know, the population would dictate that that's still going to be a demand. I mean, it, it, nationwide, housing is not keeping up. The, the building is not keeping up. However, I do believe that interest rates will probably start going up in the third or fourth quarter of this year. So we'll see how that kind of impact it has on that. Well, if, if that happens, there will be a lot of foreclosure notices for people who are probably right on the edge. Right. I mean, right now, I think there are a lot of people entering the market saying, if I got to live at home, I want to live in a place that I can actually live and work. So I think there are people who are upsizing. At the same time, and this goes to this question of the commercial side of that two by two matrix, mm -hmm. the commercial side, I think, is suffering tremendously because there are many companies that will likely not be paying their rent. So mm -hmm. the commercial side, there isn't exactly a federal bailout yet. I mean, the PPP money maybe gave a little bit of float to some commercial, but those people who have PPP money, they're not thinking about paying rent 
if they're not using their offices, their view, including law firms that are out there, mm -hmm. the view of those law firms are, there's been a frustration of purpose. I'm supposed to be using the office space for whatever number of lawyers. There's no lawyers in the office space. I'm going to terminate my lease. I'm certainly not going to renew it. And their attitude is, if this virtual stuff works during a pandemic, maybe it works generally. Now, maybe Regis does a lot better, and WeWork, to some degree, the new rendition of WeWork, the new version of it that has new management, maybe they actually take off with a more hotel-like approach mm -hmm. to meetings and the like. But I don't think you see law firms signing up to 10, 20-year leases anymore. Yeah. I think these days a five-year lease is considered a long lease. Yeah. I think law firms in particular that have a lot of knowledge workers that can work anywhere, I think they're going to go, law firms, accountants, all the rest are going to go in a different direction. So mm -hmm. we're going to see if there's no federal bailout, there's going to be a lot of office buildings. They're going to have to figure out a new strategy for what happens to those buildings because they'll be mostly empty. I don't know whether they can convert easily into housing. I think most office buildings can't. I mean, you can obviously convert yeah. a hotel. You can convert a hotel like there's a lot of hotels that aren't doing too well. You can well, convert you that say, house. Uh, wouldn't you also say what I what I'm following? I know you and I are both exchanging emails on a regular basis. Is we're keeping an eye on the mass exit of, of these companies, and the latest one, if I'm not mistaken, was Charles Schwab, who you know they've been a they I think if I'm not mistaken, they originated in San Francisco. They were amazing. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Mr. Schwab lived in San Francisco, yeah. and he had an office building in San right. Francisco, and. He believed totally in San Francisco. That guy, by the way, doesn't look his age. He's got the greatest colorist <laughs> of, his, of his hair ever, I mean. But he moved to Texas. They moved yep. the operation to Texas. And, you know, that's the last of the uh, – I keep going back to this two-by-two two quadrant because I think mm -hmm. it does set a structure up. But the state side view for office buildings is not very helpful either because fundamentally the way in which uh, the state operates – is they tax people that own those buildings on every, every last dime of net income. And so a lot of those office buildings get moved into entities outside California to try to avoid the tax. Now, whether that works or not might be an open question, but fundamentally the owners of real estate are going to start to question what is the net return on a piece of office building property right. if it's not renting very well if it still has all the high maintenance costs if it still has all the insurance and other carrying costs and if particularly interest rates go up because most commercial loans don't go for the full duration that's true of the debt it's like five years seems right. to be the standard and so the interest rate climb will impact those those owners yeah. And right. they'll be saying, this is not a good investment anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that money starts moving out. And usually with that money, the owners move out too. It's like the Elon Musk story. Why should I be in California? I can be anywhere. I have yeah. my own plane. I have offices. I can have offices in Texas. I can have offices in Nevada. Those are both tax-free states. Yeah. He's not exactly a fan of California. He sold all of his residential real estate. Mm -hmm. My guess is he will relocate for sure to a tax-free state. Mm -hmm. I mean, his agenda is to get to Mars. He's not even mm -hmm. talking about staying on planet Earth. Let's not yeah. even talk about any given state or even the United States or even the North America continent for that yeah. matter. Well, so, I, yeah. I, I think the other piece here is if we, if we fold in the demographics of the new workforce, let's face it, Jack, you know, the millennials and, and even the younger group that are coming behind the millennials are, are my children. And the younger group that are coming behind the millennials, don't you have to also think about office space and is less important to them? You can remember our age, you know, office space was important. You know, having people to your office and inviting them into your office. And, you know, that was kind of a symbol of what you did and what you stood for and what your business was for. But wouldn't you also agree that the younger generation, they could care less really, right? 
Yeah, the younger generation wants to operate with an iPad and a smartphone. Yeah. And right. maybe a keyboard if it's not too big. Like right. they think a laptop <laughs> is too big. I mean, they look at it like, you know, I got to carry that around. I mean, they want to be extremely light. They don't want, they cherish experiences mm -hmm. more than property. They don't yep. even want a car. They yep. like this Uber model. They like the, I mean, look, it is true that if you evaluate a car on the number of miles you drive it, it tends to cost way beyond what the Uber cost would be if you really looked at the number of miles yeah. you drive because right. it's sitting in the garage or sitting in your, you know, your driveway for a lot of the time waiting for service. It's very convenient, but fundamentally there's a lot. I mean, I know I've re-registered a bunch of cars here in Florida. It's a pain. There's mm -hmm. a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of hassle. There's a lot of forms. And it is the kind of thing where every year you have to pay the piper. So if you really look at the real per mile cost, it's not that cheap. So my daughter or daughters are a good example. And I know uh, people like them where initially it becomes, do I really need to get a driver's license? Mm -hmm. And then eventually it becomes, oh, I got to get a driver's license because, you know, I got to, you know, go somewhere on a regular right. basis to a yeah. job. Right. But I think a lot of people, it's a little bit like living in Manhattan. People don't think about having cars in Manhattan. They know they can't get parking. They're going to take the subway. They're going to take the bus. Now they're going to use a bicycle with this, you know, the rental bikes that are there that are on yeah. the street. Is there anything in um, real estate right now? You know, the, the one I like to, to play, or I don't know if you call it the game or the, the kind of the interesting conversation is, as we sit here today in January of 2021, if we fast forward, to, let's say 12 to 18 months, what might you think we would be saying like, oh my God, as Jack and I talked on, you know, January 13th of 2021, we would have never believed A, B or C would have happened. Do you have any ideas maybe where yeah. we might yeah. be surprised? Yeah, I, th I think we're gonna see uh beyond Elon Musk, who I think is more or less signaled, I think we're gonna see 10 to 20 major leaders of businesses in California mm. move out of the state and say how happy they are to have moved out of the state for whatever variety of reasons they might list, like, you know, value of, of reduction of taxes, real estate pricing differences, regulation, challenging issues with employees versus contractors, uh, uh, no help from Sacramento, no sense that anything is gonna rescue their business, no need to have their business. They're gonna go down a whole list and we're gonna say, wow, we kind of predicted that, but we didn't predict it as, as Furious, fast and furious as it may occur. That I think is 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 on the very, very likely agenda. And and with that, a sense that Sacramento is tone deaf to a a fire that is is burning almost out of control, where when Charles Schwab left, they should have begged him yep. to maybe stay mostly, stay partly do something symbolically, like begged him to stay, like done a special opportunity zone, like done something. I mean, this whole area of opportunity zones, I would have thought Charles Schwab could have finessed it and said, well, we're gonna move to an opportunity zone and it's not quite in San Francisco, but it's located, you know, in Oakland. And it's, we're gonna rehabilitate part of Oakland by putting up a new office building and spurring some residential stuff in the broken down parts of Oakland or even the broken well, down parts of San Francisco. I, I think, uh, I think it's sad. And again, this is just my opinion and I'll state, you know, I'll, I'll say this, but I think the politicians, Gavin Newsom all the way down the sad part for them, for the most part, the sad thing, they've become so galvanized thinking that California would never suffer Silicon Valley's the, you know, Teflon Tom or whatever you want to call it. Nothing's ever going to happen. People love this place. And I, I think they, I don't know if it's delusional thinking. I don't know if it's hopeful thinking or, 
they, you know, I, I think you're right. What's sad is that I don't see them fighting for these businesses when they leave. No, because they think somehow there's an endless chain of startups that are going to replace right. them. And it's just not, I mean, that's the second observation I'll make. I think we're going to see some major venture capital firms leave for either Nevada or Texas or some other non-tax state. They might have a little office the way in which, say, Texas Pacific has had an office for a long time in Portola Valley, and they don't get taxed by California because their principal mm -hmm. operations are in Texas. But generally speaking, I think we're going to see a lot of what would be viewed as the instigators of new investment mm -hmm. say, we're done with California. We might have a small office there, but our principal offices have moved. We've had most of our people move. And we're doing this deal flow by video conference. And we're using virtual presence techniques to get deals done, which historically we always wanted to look the founder eye to eye. Mm -hmm. We've got AI software that will be paying attention to their body language and tell us whether they're telling the truth or not mm -hmm. and whether they're authentic or not. So I think we're going to see that as a second wave behind this. And then the third wave, that I think is really gonna be sort of the third strike is startups themselves. And I've already seen this happen this year and we're only 13 days into this year. Startups saying, we want you as our lawyer, but we're telling you right now, we're not going to put our principal operations in Silicon Valley. Uh, we want you to form a Delaware corporation, but we're telling you right now, we don't want any sort of filings associated with doing business in California because mm -hmm. we're putting our office in and then pick a state, Florida, yeah. Texas, pick a non-tax state. And then they're saying, and we really are going to locate our CEO and whatnot there. And it's going to be a virtual company and there's no footprint in California. We may use Zoom, we may use Microsoft 365 Teams and the rest. But there's nothing of our equipment and our personnel in California. We're going to find talent yeah. outside California. And I'll tell you, when that starts to get to a certain tipping point, there will be people saying the normal cycle of flow of new business generation in California has now been disrupted. And when that really takes off, people are going to say, wow, this is going to have a huge negative long-term effect. Yeah. Even on places like right. Stanford University, yeah. there's, a a, uh, loop. there's a feedback loop. Right. I did a show, I think it was a week or so ago, maybe it was right before the end of the year, and I kind of focused on the year end and what my projections in the 2021. And my, just my, again, my guess and my estimate is that California, Silicon Valley, whatever you want to call it, won't wake up until one of the big three threatened to move. And I call the big three Apple, Facebook, or Google. I think because they, you know, they occupy millions and millions of square feet here, my guess is, and maybe not, maybe they'll never move, but I would think if you hear the rumblings of one of those three thinking about moving there in operations or most of them out of this state, that if that didn't get a wake-up call. Anyway, my, my point is, what's your thought? Maybe if one of those big three made that announcement, you wonder if that would get the attention of the politicians. Well, Apple just finished this $4 billion campus, so it's hard to imagine them being in the equation. Yeah. And Tim Cook has been a Californian for quite a while, although I That's think he true. started as a Texan and worked for Compact Computers. So I would put Apple at the bottom of the list. I guess I would say, if you think of the FANG companies, F-A-N-G, mm -hmm. as Facebook, Apple, Netflix. Netflix. I'd say yeah. Netflix would be the one that I would say as a thing. Google would probably be last because Google thinks that the talent is all from around Stanford and Berkeley and it's all AI and you can't get the people. But I would say Netflix could probably up and move tomorrow and have all the servers running out of Nevada and Texas and none of them in California. And probably for that matter, wouldn't make a darn bit of difference to their business. I mean, they're in Campbell, 
right now <laughs> mostly. Netflix has got the huge property right right down the street from our office in Los Gatos, Campbell. Oh, yeah. oh Los Gatos too, right? So, so it probably wouldn't take a lot. I mean, if Nevada were smart, and remember these states do compete with each other, mm -hmm. they would say, hey, we're willing to open a ginormous zone for you to have your servers running in the desert and there's this whole battery stuff going on you can have an ecosystem around tesla to keep your servers running if the electricity ever goes down i mean you'd like to have cheap electricity I and mean, if you're in a business of running a server farm that's what netflix yeah. is True. yeah they're they're also sourcing talent for movies but the movies get done all over the world they don't yeah. mostly don't even get done in california <laughs> right. anymore yeah. so fundamentally you're basically a server farm business and distribution and marketing and it's all online it's yeah. still all online and most of the growth by the way is in europe i think yeah. they've saturated the u.s market mm -hmm. i think it's hard for them to get more u.s customers they've got all the u.s customers they can ever expect to to, to have yeah. now the growth is all overseas mm -hmm. well as we wrap up we just got a couple minutes left my kind of my parting suggestions would be for those who are listening about real estate, you know, you got a pretty good dose of what we think the future is going to hold and some of the things that could change the landscape of real estate. Take advantage of the low rates right now. The cost of money have never been low. So I would say jump on that right away. If you're looking to buy investment property, I would run so far away from California wouldn't it be funny. I would not even consider that. Well, um, unless, unless it's right. such a great, unless it's yeah, such I a fabulous, so. I mean, there are occasionally fabulous deals that you, I haven't seen, I haven't seen them, but <laughs> you know, if you had like a super fat, like I would think, for example, if you could find an apartment building in yeah, Palo Alto, that's, right. that's walking distance to the campus of Stanford, it's probably always going to be rented. Mm -hmm. It's probably always going to have good tenants. It's probably always going to cash flow out. I mean, those apartments, as we know, we're paying like the equivalent of 2% return on capital yeah. because people wanted to basically pluck their money in, including many foreigners. They were viewed as very safe, bond-like investments. But yeah. I think we will see some of those go into distress based on, on people owning them that can't make uh, any increase in the interest rates. I and too. there may be opportunities, but by and large, I would agree with you that if you're going to be taxed soon at 20%, it's certainly going to go up from 13.3, probably to 16.6, and then to 20 and maybe eventually 25. And the federal side will eventually go up as well is pretty much a guarantee. So once taxes collectively <laughs> get above 50%, people start to question why are they in that particular geographic yeah. area, yeah. if they could save half that tax by being one one or two states over. Yeah, the last thing I'll say, and then Jack, tell me what your thoughts. So the last thing I'll say is I would stay away from uh, or be cautious of buying uh, any real estate in highly dense, saturated areas like downtown San Francisco, New York. Now, where I think that where most people are flocking to and that'll continue to be popular is areas near downtowns that are kind of quaint downtowns, Palo Alto, Saratoga, Las Gatas, Little Glen. Those I think will stay, continue popular. But I would say that be careful of moving into a near really, really busy city still. I'm not sure if we've seen the last of what's going to be happening to some of these major downtown cities. Yeah, I think the cities are viewed as just highly risky from a right. pandemic point of view. And if we get a second or third or fourth wave or variant, the cities are going to be viewed as not the place to be uh, hibernating or quarantining. Right. And there are a lot of people that have said, for example, Stinson Beach, which is literally less than 25 miles from downtown San Francisco, but it seems almost like another world because you have to go through this zigzaggy approach along Highway 1 to get to Stinson Beach. It's not the easiest place to get to once you get over the Golden Gate Bridge. There's a lack of inventory there. Most people are just holding because it's almost viewed as a safe haven because it's not that dense. Right. And yet it is close enough. You can literally ride a bike if you're willing to put in the mileage. You can ride a bike and certainly you can ride an electric bike 
from <laughs> since in the San Francisco. And people like the idea of occasionally visiting a city the way, say, the suburbs outside New York City are like yeah. that. All the suburbs yeah. of Connecticut and, and you know, Yonkers and White Plains and to be just a, a, a train ride away or a bike ride away for that matter. Yeah. People like that, but to live actually in the city and deal with all of the nastiness that comes with density, I think people are waking up to it's a health risk. Yeah. It's just too much of a health risk. Right. I agree with it you. It is. All right. Well, before we duck out again, remind everybody where they could reach you. I know you're uh, in Florida, but you're still operating full force throughout the United States. So. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> na we're a national firm. Actually, we, we probably are one of the few firms that really do have lawyers licensed in like eight or 10 different places. So we're, you know, for, for the size of firm, we actually have a lot of reach. So it's yeah. Jack Russo, Jay Russo at Computer Law, or just Jack at computerlaw.com, 650-327-9800. Uh, generally speaking, we do pick up the phone, we do get emails, we do get text messages, people do <laughs> connect with us, and we are still handling cases. The courts are open, but with variation, whether you have a case in California or New York or DC, it just depends on the court. And I'd say in general, they're all trying to play catch up but the truth is there's still a lot of worry yeah. about whether or not they can really fully reopen. Yeah. There are a lot of judges that are probably working twice as hard mm -hmm. uh, behind their desks, carrying out their mission and doing all the right things. Yeah. But there's still a lot of cases and probably there'll be a, a higher volume of cases filed this year than mm -hmm. last year. Because people are now realizing, wow, there's a lot of issues out there that aren't exactly getting a resolution. I think yeah. the courts will be far more busy. And the other prediction I'll make is the courts will be far more busy in 2021 than 2020 and probably mm -hmm. even busier in 2022. And the mediators and arbitrator, arbitrators and all those neutral nonprofit organizations that provide talent for resolution of disputes they will be far busier yeah. this year as well well before i also want to remind i think next week if he could come on uh related to this issue we could get steve and he could talk to the same subject we had but from a tax perspective right right steve rabin is an expert yeah. cpa on tax right. matters and he's got a lot of thoughts about you know what works and what doesn't work and what's likely going to play out and what's not likely going to play out. So yeah, we'll try to get him on for next week at this time. All right, all right, Thanks, Jack. Joe. Take take care of yourself. Okay, you too. Take care. Have all a right, good day. Bye -bye. Here at Real Estate Radio Live. Thanks again for Jack Russo joining us today. For more information, you can always go to reradiolive.com. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com.